welcome once again to the Berlin Functional Programming Group. I'm pleased to welcome Luke Thielen, who is visiting us tonight from Belgium. Luke is a software engineer at Kabisa, yeah. and he is, I would assume, a diehard functional programmer because, as he's told me, he used to be a C++ programmer, and I would assume he has the zeal of the converted. He joined func the uh, functional programming movement by way of Elixir and Haskell, and he's going to be talking to us tonight about a very interesting library called Souffle Haskell. And I hope all of you have some interesting questions to ask. So the way we normally do it, I hope this is okay with Luke. If you have a question, just type it into chat and either I will wait for an opportunity to interrupt and allow you to ask your question, or you can tell me that you prefer me to ask your question for you. Um, does that work for you, Luke? Or do you want people to ask their questions at the end? Oh yeah, you can ask them in between. Uh, yeah, that's perfectly fine. Okay, please don't unmute and just jump in because that can get a little chaotic. I, I will give you a chance to unmute. So please use the chat. And with that, uh, you've heard enough from me, Luke. I'm gonna switch over to you. Yeah. And uh, you can share your screen and welcome. Yeah, hang on a moment. Uh... You should be able to see my uh, screen now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> then the hardest part is out of the way for me. <laughs> so uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Um, yeah, today I will be talking about a library of mine, Souffle Haskell. Uh, but before I do that, I want to give a quick thank you to my employer, uh, Kabisa, uh, for giving me the time to uh, prepare this presentation so that I can give it to you all. Uh, they're a consultancy located in the Netherlands, uh, yeah, focusing on uh, custom-built uh, software uh, solutions, uh, mostly web-based. Um, and yeah, some of our projects uh, uh, use some functional programming languages under the hood. Um, no Haskell yet, but uh, I'm, I'm working on that. Uh, but if that sounds interesting, uh, let me know. Um, anyway, uh, onwards with the talk. Uh, so today I will be uh, talking about not one language, but two. So Haskell, uh, I think, yeah, most of you probably heard about that already, and uh, Souffle. And what that is, you will see uh, uh, during the presentation. So uh, what is the presentation going to be like? Uh, first of all, tell a little bit about the backstory uh, of how I got the idea of writing this uh, library, because yeah, I don't think it's that... Uh, yeah, straightforward, and uh, yeah, I think it's a good story. Uh, and then I will show you what the library is like, how you can use it, and I will explain uh, the features along the way, uh, yeah, uh, along with uh, some examples. And uh, yeah, like uh, Stephen said, you can ask questions uh, uh, in between or at the end, uh, that's both fine. So uh, yeah, first a little bit of uh, backstory. So uh, yeah, I, I've been a software engineer for I think uh, six or seven years now. But um, yeah, one thing I've always uh, found annoying is uh, yeah, our discipline compared to other engineering disciplines like civil engineering, uh, it's completely different. So if, if an engineer builds a bridge, uh, they, they assume that it will stay uh, upright forever and that, that it will keep working and it will never crash. But if you uh, compare that to software, it's totally different. It's really, really hard to write uh, correct and robust programs. And uh, yeah, for me, that's really frustrating because yeah, you, you want to write uh, correct and robust uh, programs. So uh, yeah, that, that uh, got me searching and, and thinking like, yeah, there has to be a better way. And um, yeah, I, I had uh, some courses uh, in school uh, and yeah, some of them were in Haskell and some in uh, Erlang, which is uh, related to Elixir. Uh, and that's, yeah, that, that sparked like the idea, like there is a better way. Uh, and yeah, I started digging deeper and deeper into it even after I uh, graduated. Uh, and yeah, nowadays I'm mostly uh, programming in Elixir and Haskell. Uh, Elixir is uh, my day job or well, part of it at least. And Haskell is uh, mostly my free time. Um, and yeah, I, I like both languages uh, because they have a very different approach, but they both try to solve the, the correctness and robustness uh, problem in different ways. So you have Elixir 
and it uh, has it runs on the Erlang VM, and it it has uh, yeah a really nice approach of uh, uh, writing uh, scalable programs and uh, yeah also uh, making them really robust by isolating states into really small processes. Uh, and if something goes wrong, you just kill that off, and it starts off uh, from a clean start all over again. Um, and yeah, the, the the functional paradigm help, helps a lot there as well to uh, uh, yeah to 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 guarantee the correctness. Uh, and yeah, in contrast with that, you have Haskell, and um, yeah, there you have a completely different approach. It's uh, much more based on uh, theory and on math and uh, category theory. Um, and then you you also have uh, yeah really nice things like the type system uh, to try and prevent as many errors as possible. Um, so yeah, I, I I'm not saying that either one of the approaches is uh, better than the other, but uh, yeah, I think they they both have their own uh, uh, pros and cons, and I, I think it's really uh, yeah I, I think it's a, a step forward uh, compared to the most uh, compared to what you have in most uh, mainstream languages. Um, yeah, and anyway, uh, in my free time, it's now mostly Haskell. And uh, yeah, if, if some of you uh, have used Haskell, <laughs> then you probably know that's quite a deep uh, rabbit hole you can go into. Uh, first of all, you have the statically typed uh, uh, pure functional programming uh, aspect of it. Uh, you have category theory. Um, but there's also quite a big part of Haskell is uh, focusing on, on compilers and interpreters. So uh, yeah, and I also found that really interesting. and. Um, yeah, I started tinkering with compilers. Uh, uh, yeah, some small, some big, um, and then you yeah you come across a lot of uh, different things. Um, yeah, uh, and um, yeah, that that also makes you wonder like what are the compilers like for functional programming languages themselves? Huh? Do we have really efficient compilers like uh, uh, for C plus plus? And um, yeah, C++ has technologies like uh, LLVM, that's like a common uh, compiler backend. Uh, and it's really, uh, yeah, it's really uh, good at optimizing uh, languages that look like C and C++. But if you try and optimize a functional language using LLVM just really straight in a really straightforward way, uh, your results won't be that, that great, actually. Um, so th yeah, that got me thinking, uh, yeah, Again, eh, there, there has to be a better way, or somebody must have figured this out already. And that's when I came across uh, the Grin project on GitHub. So uh, Grin is a little bit uh, like LLVM. It's, it, uh, it's a common compiler backend, so you can have multiple languages that compile down to Grin. And that will then, in, it, uh, yeah, in itself, compile further down to really efficient assembly. And uh, the nice thing uh, of Grin compared to LLVM is that Grin uh, takes in, into account a lot of those uh, patterns that you come across in functional languages. Um, and uh, yeah, last week uh, in this meetup, you had uh, Chaba as a guest speaker, and he is uh, uh, one of the, uh, the, uh, the members of the Grin, Grin team. So uh, yeah, that's actually kind of funny that uh, the two talks uh, yeah, uh, follow that well uh, with each other. Uh, but yeah, they're doing really interesting work. And uh, yeah, it got me wondering, how do they do all those uh, complex uh, compiler analysis and transformations? And then I came across uh, Souffle, uh, what this talk is about uh, today. And um, yeah, I started looking into it and I saw it had a C++ library. And I, I used to be a C++ developer. So I, yeah, I, <laughs> I started tinkering with it. And before I knew it, I, I had a working uh, prototype uh, that I could use from Haskell. Um, oh, yeah, before I uh, forget to mention, Grin itself was also written uh, or is written in Haskell. And that's also why I wanted uh, uh, to write Haskell bindings for Souffle to make it uh, easier for them. Anyway, what is Souffle? It's, yeah, it's, it's a recipe, but that's not what I'm uh, going to be talking about today. Uh, no, uh, Souffle is a, a data log uh, variant. So uh, yeah, data log is a subset of Prolog, um, which is a logic programming language. And um, Prolog is, yeah, I think, the, the most well-known one. Uh, and yeah, Prolog is also Turing complete, but data log is not. Um, it's, it's much more limited than Prolog. That might sound like a bad thing, but um, 
yeah, it allows for data log to be uh, optimized much more. Uh, and that's actually a really nice property to have. And um, yeah, what is uh, Souffle used for? So uh, it's mostly used for static analysis. Uh, so in uh, compilers, interpreters, uh, linters, um, yeah, stuff like that. Um, but it's also used uh, for things like security checks, so uh, firewalls. Um, yeah, recently I learned that they use it at AWS for uh, checking the uh, VPC uh, configurations that, uh, yeah, that there's no bad configurations in your uh, private network in the cloud. Um, but yeah, Souffle can also be used in general for graph algorithms. It's really uh, well suited for that. And um, yeah, the nice thing about data log, it's uh, super high level. So you, you can write really short code, but you can, yeah, it's really expressive. Um, and that, yeah, the good thing about that is that you can prototype really fast and you can also experiment really fast. And that's, that's a really powerful uh, uh, property to have, uh, especially if you have really complex uh, algorithms, because you can then uh, simply try out a lot of different things and uh, figure out uh, what works best. And um, yeah, in, in the past, uh, there were other data logs that also had the same ID, but the problem there most of the time was that it, uh, it wasn't too efficient. So yeah, the, 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 the algorithm would probably work, but the, the, the code that it generates would not be that fast. But uh, the, the really nice thing about Souffle is that it, that it generates really efficient uh, C++ code. And uh, yeah, sometimes uh, apparently even faster than handwritten code I've seen in uh, some presentations. So that's, yeah, that's a really nice property to have. Um, and yeah, it also scales up uh, really nicely to, to millions of uh, uh, facts as you will see uh, later on. Um, so yeah, it's, it's both high level and really efficient. That's uh, like the perfect combination. Uh, and yeah, and the last thing about Souffle is that it's made to be embedded. Um, so yeah, you can either do that via the C++ API or via CSV files. Uh, my library supports both. Uh, and yeah, that also has pros and cons, but I will go over that later. Um, but yeah, because it's meant to be embedded, it's, yeah, it's also really easy to write uh, bindings for it. So um, yeah, that's uh, Souffle in a nutshell, but uh, let's see what, what the code is like. and. Um, yeah, I think the easiest way to show it is with this introductory example. So first of all, try imagining how would you write uh, a program that computes all nodes that are reachable from another node. Uh, yeah, just think of what that would look like in your favorite language. Uh, for me, it's Haskell. <laughs> for, for some of you, that's maybe another language. Uh, but I, yeah, I think that the solution is not that straightforward. Um, but uh, and yeah, in Souffle, uh, these kinds of problems are really uh, yeah, they are really straightforward here. Um, and before I go to the next slide with code, uh, something you have to know about uh, logic programming languages is that um, uh, in, in those types of languages, you typically write down uh, the things that you see, and then uh, you try to give a specification of, what you, uh, of the problem you are encountering, and uh, then you will get the solution for free. And that's a really cool property of uh, those those logic programming languages. Okay, so uh, uh, before I go to the next slide, what does a graph uh, look like? So a graph has uh, nodes, and in these nodes, uh, right now, there's uh, some letters indicating which node it is, and you have edges in between them. So, okay, let's see what the code looks like. Um, so in Souffle, uh, it makes uh, heavy use of types. Uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, first of all to, to prevent some mistakes, but I also underneath the hood, I think it uses it to generate uh, the most efficient possible uh, code. Um, and say for example, uh, in, or for this example, you, we will have two kinds of uh, facts. So you have an edge fact. So um, we will be giving, uh, we, will, we will be adding uh, facts to the system saying, oh, you have an edge between this point and this point. Um, and yeah, before you wonder what this is, uh, this means that the fact has two arguments, uh, both are symbols, which is uh, comparable to strings in other languages. Um, and uh, yeah, that uh, we will be writing down the facts. And as a result, we want to, uh, we want to uh, query, uh, yeah, which nodes are reachable from one another. And then we get another fact, it, uh, yeah, it has the same format. Uh, so, 
uh, this will give us all the the pairs of reachable nodes so uh, a will be reachable from b and so on um, so yeah first of all you you declare the the types of facts you have in the program and then the next thing you have to do is you have to write down how will be how will we be using these facts so we will either be using them as an input so in this case we will be uh, giving uh, edges or edge facts to the system and then we will get back reachable uh, facts uh, and that's why reachable is marked as an output um, and yeah those facts they can be both input and output uh, yeah that depends on the needs of your program of course um, but uh, yeah you, you have to explicitly mark it uh, in which way you will use it so now, now we have declared which facts uh, our program contains and also in the ways we want to use it. So now we can start uh, writing down a specification of our graph. So yeah, uh, trust me here, this is the uh, complete set of facts uh, of the, the graph on the previous slide. Uh, and the way you, you can read this is as follows. So uh, we have an edge and we have it between the node A and between the node B. And so the, the arguments are given between parentheses and each uh, fact is ended by, uh, by a period. So it's really straightforward. And yeah, you just write down all the facts. Um, yeah, you can, you can uh, write down the facts here directly in the data log file, or you can do it uh, yeah, uh, dynamically uh, via the, the interface that they provide. But here to keep it simple, I, I added directly inside the file itself. Um, and then once we have the facts, now, now we can start uh, yeah, qu querying our uh, system to, to find out which nodes are reachable from one another. One another. Uh, and we can do this in two ways, or, or, or we can split up our problem in two uh, sections, I guess you can call it. Uh, so here we define a predicate, reachable. Uh, and it's, uh, what this says is there are two points, X and Y, and they're reachable from one, one another. If you have, and yeah, this is basically a fancy way of writing down an if, but uh, two points are reachable from one another if you have uh, either a direct edge between X and Y. So that's uh, yeah, the, the base rule. Um, or you have uh, two points that are reachable from one another, one another if you have uh, a direct edge from X to a third point Y or, uh, yeah, and I mean, uh, if you have, uh, uh, if you can reach the point Z from uh, the point Y. So I think this is easier to, <laughs> to explain via the webcam. So either two points are reachable directly from uh, one another, or you have a third point and then you first go to the, the third point and then you go to the end point, then it's also reachable. So I think uh, you can immediately see that uh, the predicates uh, or predicates uh, in data log, they are super short, uh, but they are really expressive. And yeah, part of that is because uh, here you have this uh, recursion uh, going on basically, and the data log will expand that for you. And it will keep on finding facts uh, until yeah, it doesn't find any more. And then, uh, yeah, then it's finished and then you can uh, see what the results are. Um, but yeah, this is uh, all you have to write to, to find out uh, which nodes are reachable uh, in the graph. Okay, um, so that's the, the souffle part of it. But now, yeah, we want to use Haskell to, to interact with this souffle. What does that look like? Uh, so that's uh, the next code snippet. So first of all, we will need some extensions. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't think it would be a, <laughs> a normal Haskell program. Uh, yeah, there are some exotic or more exotic extensions in there like data kinds and type families. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's perfectly fine if you're not familiar with them. I will just be using them in the, in the code below. And yeah, that's always how you use it in, in the API that I provide. Um, and for the rest, yeah, it's perfectly fine. So um, yeah, and at the bottom I said, uh, this is not a boring Haskell talk. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's a thing that's been going around. But uh, yeah, my library definitely makes use of some uh, fancy type level features uh, to make the API as strict as possible. Um, because I, I want to try and prevent as many uh, user errors uh, as I can. Um, and the only possible way you should be able to use a library is in the correct way. That Well, that's at least uh, my opinion. And yeah, I tried to... Uh, uh, 
uh, how do I say it? I tried to make that clear in uh, all the functions in the library. Anyway, um, the, using the library is really simple. It's uh, only one qualified import. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, language.souffle.compiled. And what this compiled means, I will uh, come back to that in a few slides. Um, but yeah, you only need one import and all the functions and type classes are available under there. And then another important Im import you have to do is the GHC uh, generics because the library makes really heavy use of that to remove most, most of the boilerplate. Uh, and once you have done that, we can start writing uh, our Haskell code. So, and um, yeah, now I want you to imagine that the souffle file that we uh, wrote on the previous slide, that we save that in a, in a file, uh, for example, path.dl for uh, computing which paths are reachable in the graph. Uh, and the way I made my library is that you need to uh, define a really simple data type uh, as a kind of handle uh, for that souffle program. So if you have a path.dl, you will also need a, a path a data type, or well, it doesn't have to be called path, but yeah, you need a data type that, that uh, corresponds with it because we will be attaching information uh, to it later. Uh, and what we need next is, uh, if you remember, we have we had two kinds of facts uh, in our souffle uh, code snippets, and we need those same facts on the Haskell side because otherwise you can't send the data back and forth. So we, we create two new data types, edge and reachable. Uh, yeah, in, on the souffle side, they each took uh, two symbols. And yeah, on the Haskell side, you can choose it's either strings or text, and that's both supported. Uh, and yeah, an important thing to note here is that they have to derive uh, generic. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's where the magic uh, happens underneath the hood. Uh, it generates a lot of code uh, for you. Uh, so yeah, now we have our... Uh, and we have our souffle uh, handle and we have our uh, fact data types. So now we can start uh, writing down some metadata so that my library will know how to uh, communicate with souffle. So first of all, uh, yeah, we have two different type classes. We have program and fact. And the program type class, uh, yeah, that's mostly concerned with that uh, handle data type, so path. And, uh, we have to specify two things. So we have to say which facts are underneath uh, or, or belong to the path program. So in this case, it's the edge fact and the reachable fact. Um, and then uh, something else we need to uh, provide is we need to say under which name uh, the program was saved. So uh, path.dl, uh, that means that we here we have to, uh, that here we refer to the, the path uh, program. Um, yeah, it's a one-on-one one -on -one, uh, or one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, and that's, yeah, all we need to specify for the program. And now we have to go to the level of one specific fact. And for each of those facts, you have to specify again if it's an, an input or an output or both. Um, and also you have to write down uh, what the fact uh, looks like on, on the souffle side. So yeah, that was the lowercase version, uh, basically. Um, and now that, now that we did this, it's, yeah, it's a little bit of boilerplate, but now my library knows enough uh, uh, to communicate with uh, Souffle. Well, it knows what the, the program is structured like, but to communicate with it, we need to be able to send data back and forth. And for that, I created the, the Marshall uh, type class for marshalling the data back and forth between uh, Haskell and Datalog. Uh, and here again, I use the generics uh, from Haskell to yeah, completely generate all the code for me. So yeah, this type class, uh, it, it has some methods, but they're completely uh, generated automatically. Uh, yeah, so the only thing you still have to do is uh, write down an empty instance and uh, yeah, <laughs> the compiler does the rest for you. So yeah, now uh, my library knows enough about the program to communicate with it and we can send the data back and forth really easily. Uh, so now we can start using uh, uh, souffle from Haskell. And yeah, for this, I have a final function called run souffle, which uh, runs the souffle uh, interpreter or uh, the compiled code. Uh, and here we give it uh, a path, uh, the, the handle type, uh, the handle data type that I mentioned before. Um, and then it will try to load up uh, souffle and it will try and uh, 
yeah, it will try to initialize it and it will either fail because maybe it doesn't find uh, the program or, or uh, the, souff the souffle interpreter and then you have to handle that. Uh, if in, in case something goes wrong, you get back uh, a nothing uh, value. Uh, yeah, and here I put a really simple print statement, but yeah, in, in your application, it would probably be more complicated. But, but in the case that it goes right, you get back another kind of handle. Uh, this is not the same as this handle. There's uh, some more, yeah, it's a slightly different uh, data type. And once we have that uh, new handle, we can start adding the facts to, to uh, souffle. And it's really easy. If you have some data, you can just, uh, you, you don't even have to transform it manually. That's automatically done for you. So you can just construct a data type uh, and you can either add them one by one with the add fact function, or you can add many at once. Uh, and it supports also any foldable data structure. So it supports uh, lists, factors, arrays, uh, and so on. That's all uh, supported. Um, so yeah, uh, you add a bunch of facts uh, to the system, uh, but Souffle will not automatically compute all those facts uh, or all the derived facts uh, for you. Uh, you have to kick that off uh, manually. And for that, we have the run function. And after this run function, then Souffle will have computed all the facts that it could find. Uh, and yeah, now, now they're still on the Souffle side, but we still need to uh, retrieve them and uh, get them back on the Haskell side. And for that, we have two more functions. So we have uh, uh, the get facts function and the find fact function. So yeah, either you uh, want all the facts uh, that it computed, or uh, you only want to find like one or two specific facts um, and yeah, Depending on your use case, uh, you, sh you should use one of the two functions. So get facts uh, returns them all. And find fact is uh, yeah, meant if you only are searching for one or two facts. And um, yeah, find fact is also optimized for that use case. So it's, a, it's much quicker than uh, first finding all the facts uh, and then going through that list and uh, uh, seeing if, if your specific fact is in there. Uh, yeah, it's much more optimized. Uh, and you might see that here there is a type signature that's normally not necessary, but yeah, to keep the code simple, uh, I immediately print out the results again. Uh, and because I do that, uh, that excuse me, the, the Haskell compiler um, doesn't have enough information about what these results can be. That's, uh, yeah, it, if, if I add a different uh, type here, this get facts function will do completely something different. And it's the same for this uh, container type. So if I add a list here, again, get facts function will do something different. So it's like a little, uh, yeah, it's kind of uh, type uh, directed programming. Um, and because we print out the results immediately, we have no information about it. So we have to add it here manually. Uh, but if you use my library normally, if you are yeah, in most Haskell code, you have uh, sig uh, type signatures on the top level. Uh, and then, yeah, the Haskell compiler has enough information and then you can omit uh, this type signature completely. So, um, yeah, then, then the code becomes even shorter. Um, yeah, and that's all you need to, to send uh, the data to the souffle side to make it to, to let the engine run and compute all the derived facts and then get all the results back again. So it's really straightforward, I, I think. Um, and yeah. Now let's take a closer look at what uh, some of the features or highlights of this library are. So, um, yeah, I, I tried to keep uh, the API as, as small as possible. So I think on the previous slides um, or, or two slides before this, technically, uh, yeah, I basically used the entire API. So you have only six top level functions and three type classes. Um, yeah, there's a lot more going on underneath the hood, but uh, yeah, you, you don't need to know all about that. It's all, it, yeah, this is all you need to know uh, about, yeah, communicating with Souffle. And I try to keep it as small as possible. Uh, and yeah, also the GHC generics, like I mentioned before, really help a lot here in removing all the boilerplates uh, with serialization and uh, uh, other stuff like that. Um, and yeah, another nice uh, or nice feature that it has is, um, I, yeah, I also mentioned this uh, briefly before. So we have two kinds of uh, what I call modes. So you can run Souffle either in interpreted mode or in compiled mode. 
and that uh, what that means is interpreted mode is that uh, if you run your uh, Haskell code that run that uh, uses souffle underneath the hood, then you need a souffle interpreter at runtime. It will take the data log file and then it will uh, on the fly yeah compute all the derived facts, and then it will use uh, CSV files to to read and write uh, results uh, back and forth. Um, but yeah, that's not the most efficient way. Uh, if you want, uh, yeah, the more efficient approach, then you should uh, use the compiled mode, and then the data log will be compiled ahead of time to C++ code. Uh, and also, you can directly uh, call C++ functions to to read from the RAM and um, uh, yeah, read and write the the facts uh, directly via RAM. That's uh, much quicker. Um, and yeah, the nice thing about uh, both modes uh, is that I, I try to keep an identical API. Uh, the interpreted mode has yeah, some extra helper functions for debugging. Uh, but what you can do now is uh, you can start off in interpreted mode, and that's really uh, easy to, to develop with. You also have no com compilation uh, waiting time. You, yeah, it's just, uh, it, it's yeah, pretty much instant. So you can uh, work on your algorithm, iterate on it, uh, test it properly, and once it's finally working, yeah, then you can export it to a C++ uh, file, and then you can, uh, uh, yeah, you, you get a big performance boost uh, completely for free. And uh, yeah, the only thing you need to do is change one word in the import, and that's it. So you, you get both the quick development uh, cycles and yeah, the, the great performance as well. Um, yeah, and then uh, another thing that this library does is, um, yeah, because we have so much uh, information on the type level with those three type classes, or, or I should say uh, two type classes. So we have the program uh, type class and the fact type class, uh, and they contain all the metadata of your uh, souffle program. So we can reason on the type level a lot about what our program looks like. Uh, and that helps a lot in, um, in making the, the souffle functions itself really strict in what they allow. And uh, that way I can make it uh, possible to, to uh, disallow a lot of invalid use cases uh, or, or usage uh, patterns. Uh, and only the, the correct uh, patterns yeah, should be possible. Uh, that, that's the first thing that we can do because we have so much uh, information on type level. And the next nice thing that we can do is we can query all those types uh, at the type level and we can even create custom type errors with, uh, uh, with it. And um, yeah, that's actually kind of necessary because uh, some of the, the uh, features that I use underneath the hood are quite complex. And sometimes you would get uh, quite a complicated error message, but if you add a, a custom uh, type error on top, the first thing that you, you see is uh, the custom type error. So uh, that hopefully makes it a little bit easier for the developers working on, uh, on Haskell code uh, that calls into Souffle. Um, and yeah, I, I also think it's uh, really important that if you have a library that the developer experience is as, uh, as good as possible. So what does the, what does a custom type error uh, potentially look like? So I have uh, a lot of different ones, but this is just one of the examples. So here at the bottom, you have the souffle uh, or the, the Haskell code. Uh, and if you remember, uh, reachable was an output fact. So that means that we can read it from souffle to Haskell, but not the other way around. Uh, then we would have to mark it as an input uh, as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's a logic uh, mistake. So yeah, I, and we know that beforehand because it's all captured in the types. So we can catch that and we can write down a custom type error and that's always at the top. So uh, it, yeah, here I, uh, it, yeah, I try to give uh, a good explanation of what is going on. So you try to use an output fact uh, as an input. So yeah, you can try changing the fang direction. Um, yeah, or yeah, what I hope that happens is that it triggers the developer to think, um, oh yeah, this is wrong. Or maybe uh, I should have uh, serialized a completely different fact. So I, I should have maybe used an edge here instead of a reachable uh, fact. Yeah, I, I can't know all the possible errors beforehand, but I always try to give one possible solution. Uh, I, I try to nudge the people in the right direction, but yeah, that's all. Uh, you, you can always imp improve on this, uh, right? 
So, and yeah, this is the part of the custom type error. And here you get the rest of the type error, which is uh, yeah exactly the same as normal uh, in a Haskell program. So it will give you uh, where exactly in the program that it went wrong. Uh, so you can do your uh, usual debugging with it as well. Uh, and yeah, I have a lot of different, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different things uh, that you can check. Uh, one of those things is, uh, yeah, I didn't mention this before, but fact data types always have to be uh, uh, like record uh, types or simple product types. So uh, you, you, yeah, sometimes uh, are not supported, uh, not yet at least. Um, but let's say that we do uh, try to serialize uh, a fact that is a sum type. Well, yeah, I, I can again uh, see that uh, ahead of time uh, on the type level, so I can give you a custom error message uh, uh, based on that. Uh, and yeah, I have a lot of different uh, type errors in the library, and yeah, that way I try to make it uh, as easy to use as possible and also try to make it clear uh, what is supported and, and what isn't. Um, yeah, another thing about the library is, so uh, yeah, you mentioned, uh, or you might have heard me uh, mention C++ uh, a few times already. So if you have uh, some souffle code and you compile it down to C++, uh, that, that C++ code needs to be bundled with your uh, dependency uh, or with your library, but your library can in turn become a dependency for another uh, package. So I tried to make a small schematic of that. So you have uh, my library, Souffle Haskell. Then you have a dependency that uses uh, Souffle Haskell. Then you have another package that uses the dependency. And what you want now is um, and the dependency, it needs to have uh, the Souffle headers installed um, or, or, or it needs to have them available because it has the, uh, the Souffle, uh, it, yeah, it needs to be able to comply, compile the Souffle, uh, Souffle C++ code. Um, but you don't want the package to know that this dependency contains souffle. You, you just want it to, um, yeah, it, it should just work like any other Haskell package. So what I uh, did here, and this was actually a suggestion from uh, Chaba, who was a, a speaker here last week, and it was uh, to, to bundle uh, all the C++ headers that you need along with uh, my library, and then automatically all hack Haskell packages that depend on it uh, will have all the necessary header files. And then, yeah, then you uh, create that illusion that it's just a Haskell package and nobody needs to know that Souffle is used underneath the hood. That's just a technical detail now. Um, and yeah, one thing I have to mention, this only works if you uh, uh, use my library and, and if you use Souffle in compiled mode. So if you use it in interpreted mode, it will not work because then you will still need uh, the Souffle interpreter at runtime. Uh, but yeah, I would suggest always only uh, uh, using a compiled souffle if you have a working algorithm, uh, because yeah, it's just so much faster. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, that, that was actually, <laughs> it's kind of funny, but that's where uh, my talk would have ended a few months ago. But uh, yeah, like I said before, Haskell is uh, used a lot in the, in the compiler uh, world. And yeah, myself, I also like tinkering on compilers. So I was thinking, what would a souffle DSL look like in Haskell? Does it make sense? Um, and yeah, I started thinking on it, uh, like, yeah, does it give you any, any benefits? Uh, and one of those benefits that I uh, could think of was, oh yeah, then you don't have to write the data log anymore and it can be completely Haskell. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I just started experimenting with it and, uh, yeah, I, let me go and uh, uh, explain the thought process that I went through. So this is exactly the snippet that I used to, uh, to figure out if, if a DSL was possible. Um, and yeah, the question is as follows. So the snippet we had before, minus uh, the hard-coded facts that we had, uh, is it possible to write that uh, in Haskell in a straightforward kind of way? Um, and yeah, first of all, let's split it up into two pieces. So we have the part where we give uh, some information about uh, the types or the, the facts that we use in the system. Um, and yeah, if you remember, uh, we already have a lot of information about the facts on the Haskell side. Uh, yeah, before we needed that to, to, to match the souffle side, but you can, all, you can also flip it around and then you can use the information that you have on the Haskell side 
to generate uh, the type information on the data log sites. So what we need to do now is the, the, the part of the snippet that's shown here, um, we need to be able to write that down in Haskell. So um, yeah, uh, I, I modified my uh, previous snippet uh, slightly. Uh, so yeah, there's one extra uh, type class, but it can be derived also automatically. Uh, yeah, that's only a minor detail, so I won't focus that much on it uh, today, but it can be used to uh, optimize the performance even more. Um, but for the rest, it's completely the same as before. We have our two uh, fact data types, uh, also the, the fact direction and um, the name of the fact. Yeah, we, we provided that already, and that's also all the information we need on the on the Haskell site to generate all the uh, all the code on the data log site because yeah we, we not only have this information but we also here we know the entire structure of the the, the edge uh, constructor or, or the edge data type and we know that the edge uh, data constructor that it has two strings inside so we can use that information to generate the data log code uh, but what we need is like a kind of a magic function. Uh, I, I called it uh, predicate for. So what it means is give me a predicate for uh, this type. So this is a, a type application. It's basically a way to give uh, in Haskell a, a type as a para parameter to a function. Um, and yeah, if we can figure out a function that takes in a type and gives us back a, a predicate that we can use to, to glue uh, other uh, parts of the souffle program together. Um, yeah, th then uh, yeah, then we can write our DSL. Uh, yeah, and I, I managed to do it this way. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't wouldn't have seen it on the slide. Um, but the next part that we need to convert is the logic part. So you have the uh, the hard coded facts uh, potentially, and you have your predicates uh, that that consist of uh, one or more rules. So uh, in our case, we have the, the reachable uh, predicates. And um, yeah, we, we want to convert this. So uh, the way we do this in Haskell is with uh, yeah, the overloaded literals. So in Haskell, you can uh, use or maybe even abuse uh, the, the literals that it has. So yeah, if you, if you see a five in, in Haskell code, it doesn't have to be an integer. It can be any custom data type. So you can also make uh, heavy use of that uh, in, in a DSL as well. Um, yeah, you also have custom operators. So you, all the operators in data lock, you can also mirror them one by one on the Haskell site, um, unless they are used for something in Haskell already. Um, and for the rest, it's, yeah, all we need is uh, functions and uh, yeah, combinators. So functions that yeah, have as a main goal to, to glue other parts of the program together. Um, and if we have that, then we also have enough to write down the entire logic part. So what does that look like? So if we continue with the snippet from before, uh, so we have this magic uh, predicate for function uh, and it takes in a type and it gives back a predicate. Um, what this is, I will explain in a few moments. Um, but first, before we do that, uh, yeah, there's one minor difference uh, between Haskell and Souffle and that's, uh, in, in uh, Souffle, yeah, variables are declared automatically if you use them, but in Haskell, we need to uh, declare them manually. So here I say, uh, cr create uh, three variables for me, X, Y, and Z, uh, so that we can use them in the code that follows. And now we will be able to use uh, these predicates that I defined here. And um, yeah, here I use a little, yeah, kind of a, a trick. Uh, so this predicate thing is actually a function um, and yeah, normally in Haskell, you would add a space here between the, the function and the arguments, uh, but you, yeah, you can leave it out. It's not normally something that you don't do, but yeah, you can do it. So uh, in this case, reachable is a function that takes a tuple of two arguments. Uh, and because of uh, all the type information we have, we also know that these uh, variables X and Y, we know that those have to be of type uh, string. So um, yeah, the, the reachable function that we have here, the predicate is actually really smart. Um, and the same goes for edge. So it's like it takes in a tuple and it gives you back a part of uh, or a piece of data log code. And now that we have this, uh, yeah, now we can also um, 
uh, think about how can we write the rest of the predicate. So before we had this, uh, we had this operator, which is like the, the if or the, the turnstile uh, operator. Um, yeah, myself, I like to use uh, the, the pipe operator followed by a dash as a turnstile. Yeah, that's completely uh, uh, possible in Haskell. And it's also yeah possible to define it as a synonym for, for this because yeah, we have custom operators. Um, but yeah, what this operator does is it takes uh, this piece of data log code and it takes this piece of data log codes and it gives back an even bigger piece of data log codes. Uh, and yeah, if we run that at the end, it will generate the data log code as we expected. Um, yeah, so that's the first part of the predicate. And then the second part of the predicate, uh, yeah, before, yeah, you might have remembered or maybe I went a little bit too fast over that is that here we had a comma uh, meaning an ant, uh, a logical ant. Uh, yeah, in Haskell we don't have that, um, but yeah, we have do syntax and then we can write first this and then this and then this. And yeah, if you squint your eyes a little bit, it looks still quite a lot like the data log codes. So uh, yeah, we can just uh, write down almost uh, the same code. So first, um, we, we say, yeah, it needs to have this predicate. Uh, and we need the direct edge between X and Y. And then we need uh, the predicate reachable to be true between Y and Z. And this, uh, this entire piece of, uh, yeah, this monadic piece of code, uh, actually, um, if, if you run that, the end result will be the data log code like you would expect it uh, to be. So it will just concatenate all those uh, one after another with uh, commas in between, so the logical uh, ands. So um, yeah, now now we have a DSL that looks uh, really similar to the data log code, but it's completely in Haskell. So <laughs> that's uh, yeah, it's kind of strange, but it has some nice uh, properties. And one of those properties is that you can start metaprogramming with it, um, because yeah. Um, uh, yeah, you might not have noticed this, but, but if you start writing a, a lot of logic uh, code, it will, a lot of it will look like this. And uh, yeah, that's not really a problem, but uh, there's, yeah, there's some repetition involved there. And um, yeah, you might wonder, can we write this once uh, polymorphically? Um, yeah, uh, and before I go to the next slide, uh, it's kind of funny, but yeah, Souffle also has a, a mechanic for this, but I, yeah, I chose not to implement it, but uh, yeah, we can just use the Haskell type system to do it for us. So if we can write down a generic function, I will show you the type signature in a second. Uh, it's a beast, but uh, if you go over it slowly, it's, it's doable. But uh, what, what, do you, what we want to do here is we want to write uh, like a kind of generic property of our program. And in this case, it's the transitive uh, property. So if you remember uh, before, if you have uh, the graph, either two points are either directly reachable or via a third point. Uh, and that's the transitivity property. Uh, and yeah, what this function does now is it tries to, uh, or it, it, uh, it's like the generic version of what we had before. So now we have two predicates, P1 and P2. We don't know what those predicates are beforehand. So before it was edge and reachable, now it can be any predicates. Uh, and yeah, as you can see here, we can just use them like before. Okay, we need to generate some variables, but once we have the variables, we can use them exactly like before. Uh, and this will work for any uh, two uh, predicates that have the, the right uh, structure. Um, okay, so let's go over the type signature now. So first of all, this is completely optional because uh, Haskell has uh, great inference and it can infer this for you. But if you want to write it down for uh, yeah, for clarity or documentation, that's also possible. And the way you read this is uh, you have two predicates, uh, P1 and P2. Uh, and if you give those to uh, this function, you get back a, a piece of DSL code. Yeah, it has a lot of type parameters. Ignore that for now. Um, but yeah, if you give it two uh, predicates, you get back a piece of uh, DSL, a piece of uh, the data log code. Um, and if you write down just that by itself, then the Haskell type checker is not satisfied yet because it says, uh, yeah, I don't know what the structure of P1 uh, looks like. Uh, so, okay, uh, 
then yeah, I tried to give uh, the, the has to compile some more information. So I created a type family for this. So it's like a type level function. And what the structure does is uh, it takes the type and it uh, gives you back uh, a list of all the, the types uh, of the arguments of the, of the constructor. So for edge, it, it had two strings. So in this case, it would give you back a type level list of two strings. Um, and what this, uh, what this line says here is the structure has to be a list of two uh, elements of a type uh, T. It doesn't even have to be a string. It also works if your uh, predicate, for example, has uh, ints or floats or something else. That's all, that's all possible. Um, so yeah, we have a really easy way to query the structure of our uh, fact data types now. But yeah, and if you add this, it's still not enough. Uh, and then Haskell will complain about something different now and it will say, yeah, I don't know uh, that the structure of P1 is the same as the structure of uh, P2. And uh, yeah, what you need to do is add another constraint. And here you say that the structure of P1, and this is like a type level equality, uh, didn't mention that before, but here we say that the two structures have to be the same. And once you add this constraint, then Haskell is finally happy. And then it will uh, type check this function. And the nice thing about this now is, uh, yeah, now we can write down um, generic, uh, or, or we can start using uh, generic helper functions. So the, the snippet from before is transformed into this. So give me a predicate for edges, give me a predicate for uh, reachable uh, facts. And now we can say that the reachable uh, fact data type is transitive via the edge data type. And I, I think it's immediately clear that this is uh, reasoning on a, on a much uh, higher level than before. Okay, maybe it's a little, uh, more difficult than before, but yeah, after some time, you can get used to this uh, way of writing, I think. Um, and I think that this uh, allows you to write down much more complex uh, data log programs. Uh, and it, it's in a really uh, natural way because it's all done with just functions. So that's the first example of metaprogramming. And the second one is, uh, yeah, let's take, for example, a Sudoku. So uh, yeah, maybe a quick, uh, recap or, or introduction for people who are not uh, familiar with Sudokus yet, but uh, it's, a, it's a puzzle. And for each of the rows and for each of the columns and also for each of those uh, squares of nine, uh, yeah, smaller squares, I, I think you can call it, uh, for each of those, all the numbers have to be different. So you can have only one five in this row and also in the column and also in this, uh, yeah, this uh, square of nine small squares. Uh, and if you try to encode this in, in data log, it uh, quickly becomes really difficult because uh, there's no built-in function for uh, writing down that two variables have to be different. Um, it's really easy to say in, in data log that, um, uh, that two variables are, have to be the same, uh, but having, if, if you want them to be different, you have to write down uh, that a variable X is not equal to Y. And if you do that for each row and for each column and for each of those, uh, yeah, for each uh, of those, it's, I, I counted it, it's 36 uh, constraints because it's uh, n times n minus one divided by two and n is equal to nine. Uh, so that's 36. And that's a lot of constraints to write. And that's also uh, a really easy way to make mistakes because it's all numbers. So the type checker, yeah, it can't help you there. <laughs> it's all numbers, so it always type checks. Uh, yeah, maybe you make a mistake with three arguments or one, but yeah, that's a silly mistake. But th the mistakes that matter, yeah, it, it can be catched with the type checker here, and that's uh, unfortunate. Um, and yeah, also writing down 36 different constraints, you have to make sure that you don't have any duplicates in there. So it's really tedious and really error prone. Um, and yeah, yeah it, it makes you wonder, is there a better way to write this down? Uh, can, we, can we use Haskell to, to make this easier? And uh, the answer is yes. So for this, what I did was, yeah, first you have the, the obligatory uh, imports. But if we can write down a function that computes all the possible pairs, um, then, then we can really easily write down uh, the Sudoku problem. So 
first of all, let's write the function that computes all the pairs. And if, if you notice here in the type signature, there's nothing re related to my library in here. It's all about, uh, yeah, just lists of elements uh, of type A, and it gives you back a list of, uh, of pairs of type A. Um, but there's nothing souffle related here. So any pure function can be used uh, to, to generate combinations. Um, and what this function does is uh, here I put an example. So if you give the, the list one, two, three, it will give you back uh, uh, the list with one and two, one and three, and two and three. But for example, not two and one, because we already have one and two. And the way it does this is uh, with, the, with the list comprehension. So uh, first we, uh, we have a list that comes in here. Uh, yeah, a lot of uh, axes. <laughs> how, that's how they call it usually in Haskell. And then for each of those axes, we want to compute all the possible tails. Uh, and that means uh, for this list, we would get back the list one, two, three, then the list two and three, then the list with just three inside, and then the empty list. And then for each of those lists, uh, we want to get, uh, we want to uh, pattern match and destructure uh, the list into two parts. So the first element and, and the rest of the list. Uh, and if we have the first element and we have uh, the rest of the list, uh, yeah, then we need to do one more thing. And that is we need to pull out each of the individual elements of the rest of the list. Uh, and yeah, now you have the head of the list and each of the elements of the rest of the list. <laughs> yeah, it uh, gets complicated. And then you can uh, uh, create all the possible pairs with that, uh, with, with a really uh, succinct uh, one-liner. Um, yeah, and now that we have this pairs helper function, we can now start uh, using it back in our souffle code again. So for this, I create another helper function. I call it distinct uh, variables. Uh, and here you see some types that I use underneath the hood in my DSL. But basically what this says is uh, here you have a list of terms. So yeah, a variable is a kind of term, but yeah, it could also be uh, an integer, but then you, yeah, this type would have to be an integer. Um, but if you don't provide the type, the only thing uh, that you can give to it are uh, variables. So here you get a list of uh, variables. And what you get back is uh, like the, the body of a predicate or part of it. OK, so what we do is we compute all the possible pairs of our, uh, yeah, of our variables that we give to this function. And then we, then we just traverse over them. And I think the, the, the version at the bottom is the, the more readable one. Uh, and for each of those pairs, we want to uh, create a snippet of data log code. And here we just say that the first variable is not equal to the second variable. And because we have uh, the helper function that gives us back all the possible combinations, and for each of the combinations, we say that they are not uh, equal to each other, now we have basically generated the entire uh, code block uh, saying or, or stating that all the variables need to be unique, even though it's not directly supported in, uh, in Souffle. Um, so yeah, that, that was probably two quite uh, intense code snippets, but what are the benefits? So we have a question, this? Luke. Okay. So Tom has a question. So Tom, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hi, Luke, can you hear me? Yeah, hello. Hi, um, I was going to ask you, at what point does your DSL stop being a front end for souffle only and starts being a general constraint solving specification DSL? And if that becomes the case, do you need to depend on souffle only? Could you back it by something else like a Z3 constraint solver or something like that? Yeah. And the third part of my question is, are you familiar with uh, PICAT, the programming language? Um, uh, yeah, the last one uh, I'm not familiar with yet, but if you can post it in the chat, then I can uh, look it up later. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a good question. Or, or the other two questions. Um, uh, yeah, at some point, uh, yeah, you you um, yeah. How do how do I say it? Uh, you you start getting more features, uh, more features, but basically it's still the same feature set. But uh, what these functions do are, uh, is that, yeah, if you can find a way to destructure 
your complicated problem into uh, simpler problems, then you can, uh, yeah, you can introduce new concepts. That's basically what it boils down to. Um, yeah, and then you can start asking questions like where does uh, souffle end and where does the new more general uh, constraint uh, based programming starts. Yeah, that's a fuzzy line. Um, but yeah, uh, what my library does right now, it, it, uh, it provides all the simple helper functions, but it doesn't provide these kind of functions uh, yet. So I only um, have the souffle specific uh, functionality. Uh, I have been thinking about writing uh, a new module in my Haskell library, or maybe a new package even, uh, to do all these code generation things. Um, but I haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, but yeah, that, that's something I've been thinking about because then, yeah, then it becomes even more powerful. Um, and about uh, the other questions. So yeah, right now uh, the library is uh, mainly focused on souffle uh, because yeah, I, I really like how uh, compact the API is and it's really focused and to the point. Um, and I think if you start in adding more backends that don't completely fit into the into this structure, um, then I think it will com start complicating the API. And yeah, that's something I'm, yeah, I'm not looking, uh, or, yeah, I, I, I'm not looking forward to that, I guess. Um, but you could technically do it. Uh, I've, I've given this talk before and somebody asked me, is it possible to add a, a logic T? Uh, so it's like a, a kind of monad in Haskell that does uh, logic programming basically. Uh, and yeah, I, I that's, uh, yeah, a potential alternative that I definitely could use, uh, or uh, yeah, that's an alternative that could fit in the same API as this, but uh, something like Z3, I think that's uh, hard to do. And yeah, there I would just suggest to, to use the uh, Z3 libraries that Haskell has, like SBV uh, and some others, um, because yeah, then you're, it's more to the point and yeah, then I think the API stays uh, cleaner. But yeah, that's a, a, a software uh, design decision, of course. Um, yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. But uh, let me know what that third one uh, was because I don't think I'm familiar with it yet. So that sounds uh, interesting. Um, okay, so I will, I will continue now. So, um, what are the benefits of this approach? So like I said before, um, yeah, if, if you can write down, if, if um, your data log program is fully supported by my DSL, then it's now possible to write it down completely in Haskell. That's uh, one last language that you have to take uh, into account. And that might make uh, things more yeah, easy uh, for some people in, in your team, for example, um, because yeah, it's just Haskell. Um, uh, yeah, another nice thing is, uh, like you saw before, so a data log program is a normal Haskell value, and those can be transformed via functions. Haskell has really great support for that because, yeah, it's, it's functional programming. Um, so, yeah, it, it becomes really powerful. You can transform complete data log programs uh, like it's nothing, uh, and that's, yeah, really powerful. Uh, and it, yeah, it allows us to do things like code generation, like the distinct variables uh, example, or you can do stuff like uh, uh, code reuse, like uh, in the first example. Um, so you can write really generic code as well. Um, and yeah, in Souffle itself, you would need a separate uh, feature for that. But here you can just piggyback on the Haskell type system and, and it does everything what, what you wanted to do. Uh, so that's really nice. Uh, but there are some limitations. So uh, the DSL is not uh, does not fully support uh, souffle. I, I think I got uh, quite a big subset. So yeah, maybe 80% or so. So things like aggregates are not uh, supported yet. And also some of the fancier type, uh, yeah, type system stuff uh, from souffle that's not supported yet, uh, maybe in the future. Uh, but for now, it's still, yeah, the DSL is still a little bit experimental and I want to make sure that, uh, that what I have right now is already a good start and then I can start focusing on the rest. Uh, but what I would suggest there is if you are missing a feature, I would just write it down in data log and then uh, bind from Haskell to it uh, for now. Uh, and maybe in the future, it will be fully supported in, in Haskell. 
Uh, another thing is uh, I try to capture as much as possible in the Haskell type system, uh, but some things from Souffle are not that easy. So yeah, it's related to underscores and wildcards. Uh, that's yeah more difficult to, to put a constraint on to make it type check only in the correct cases. Um, or maybe I just haven't found the best way to do it yet. So, but yeah, uh, some errors are, yeah, if you know how to break it, uh, it's possible. Sometimes you have to try really hard, but it's possible. Um, but in, in the, yeah, in, in most normal cases, it, it does exactly what you expect. And it's, uh, for example, really, yeah, it's not possible to miss, um, to uh, use, for example, a variable of type string in a place where you should use a variable of type int. Um, so watch out with that a little bit. So yeah, that's mostly an issue when you are developing the algorithm. Uh, if you generate the actual data log code and you have to run it, yeah, you still have to run a true data log at one, one point, uh, then you will get the error. Uh, it just won't be at during compile time uh, in Haskell. So yeah, and I, I try to capture as much as possible, as early as possible, because then you get the quickest uh, development loop. But uh, yeah, keep that in mind if you use the, the DSL. Uh, and the final thing is, yeah, I think it's uh, clear that it's uh, a lot more complex initially, uh, but I think if you have, uh, if you are used to it, or if you ha already have a set of these helper functions that I still intend on, <laughs> on writing, uh, then I think it allows a, a reasoning on a really uh, high level. And then you can write down really complex uh, programs or complex analyses uh, with really uh, small amounts of code. So yeah, it's like a learning curve you have to get over, but once you are over it, uh, uh, it's, it starts to become really nice. Luke, Chaba has a comment he okay. would like to make. So Chaba, go Chaba. ahead. Yeah, uh, regarding the, the EDSL, uh, like um, in data log, it's also important to, to be able to do optimization of your rules, like changing the order of relations in a, in a rule uh, has a huge can have a huge effect on the performance. Yeah, like uh, can speed up ten times, hundred times, um, and uh, may, I believe that EDSL might hide the might might may uh, make this harder to uh, to optimize and the but. Yeah, you can change. So if you guarantee, then the order is the same, uh, like um, the generated uh, code uh, has the same order in the relations and the, then the Haskell EDSL, then that's fine. But if you use Haskell as a meta, uh, ultra powerful meta language, then you might not see the eventual uh, code, the, the, the result yeah. that is generated. So. So I don't know. So I just want to wanted to say that optimization is an important uh, part of the development in data log. The other one is the error messages. I don't know how complex they are if you're using this uh, advanced Haskell type system features, but yeah. uh, I have some experience with uh, EDSL development in Haskell, and it was an issue. Like it was horrible to get a not not informative error message that was. Uh, I, I could, as a developer of the library, I could understand it, but users couldn't. But yeah. uh, lately, GHC got a feature uh, which I haven't tried, but um, you can customize error messages as far as I know. Yeah. You, um, you tried that or? Yeah. Um, so there's two questions. So, um, All right. Sure. Yeah, the, the first comment is a good one uh, about performance. So, yes, sometimes the order of your uh, of your predicates is important. Um, and yeah, if you write it down in a monadic block, so first this predicate and then that predicate, that's also the, the order that it writes it down in uh, the generated data log code. So if you write really straightforward data log, you will get exactly what you expect. Uh, and the fact metadata type class that I didn't show you uh, today, it, that's uh, uh, another place where you can do optimizations because there you can say, uh, which uh, data structure it, it should use underneath the hood because yeah, then it, uh, the information that you provide there, it will put all that information at the end of the uh, dot decal uh, statement, if you know what I mean. Um, so you have 
yeah, quite a lot of uh, possibilities to tweak it, but you're right. If you uh, do the, the trick that I just showed you with uh, the Sudoku, um, yeah, then you have less control over uh, which order uh, the constraints are in. So yeah, there, yeah, you have to watch out with that a little bit. Um, but if you need the performance, you can still write it down exactly like you would like, uh, or like you would need to, to write it down. Um, that's one thing. And uh, yeah, the next thing was about uh, the compile time errors that it can be complicated. So uh, yeah, again, there I also made use of the custom type errors. Um, yeah, there are maybe a few places that I haven't figured out a good way to, to get um, always a, a good error message. So yeah, I think there's one situation that I haven't figured out yet, but all the other ones, uh, I tried to get a really uh, good compile error there. And also, uh, like I said before, I have all this information at the type level. So you can, uh, and you have, uh, because it derives generic, you can go over the entire uh, structure at compile time. Uh, that gives you a lot of possibilities to write down good uh, type sing or, or type errors. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I only know how I uh, would use the library. But uh, yeah, you're right. Maybe if somebody else who's completely new to, to the library makes a mistake, um, yeah, maybe there's a situation that I overlooked. But yeah, if that's the case, uh, I would suggest uh, to submit an issue because yeah, I, I really uh, value uh, the developer experience. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah. So if, if, if you come across a complicated uh, compile error, just uh, submit an issue. That's what I would uh, suggest. Um, and also, yeah, the DSL is still marked as experimental. So yeah, I don't think that much will change anymore, but yeah, if there's something really bad about it, then yeah, I, I can still change it. Um, and yeah, also the DSL is completely, yeah, it, it's in the same package, but it's completely separate from all the rest of the code that I showed in the first half of the talk. So um, that will always keep working. So yeah. Let's say I, I have or, or didn't implement one of those features yet in the DSL, then you can still, you, you can always still use the data log uh, approach that I showed you in, in the beginning. Um, yeah, it, it, it depends on what you find uh, the most comfortable way to, to uh, develop your algorithm. So I hope that uh, answers uh, your questions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what are some uh, projects using uh, Souffle Haskell? Um, and yeah, first of all, yeah, th this was uh, yeah, kind of sad actually, because this used to be true until the release I did like uh, last week or so. And then, yeah, I found an easier way to do this. Uh, but yeah, like I mentioned before, I have to compute the minimal set of C++ includes. Uh, and before I had a Souffle program for this, because yeah, uh, C++ includes, if you, uh, look at the connections they make with other C++ includes, then you get graph-like structure. Um, yeah, I have the script open in another tab. I can show you it at the end if we still have time left. Um, but yeah, that's how I used to compute it. But I found out that uh, the C++ compiler itself, if you give it some uh, compiler flags, it can also give you that. And that's uh, even simpler. But yeah, I guess if you have a, a hammer, <laughs> a really powerful one, every, everything starts to look like a nail. Um, yeah, <laughs> if you want to see that example at the end, just uh, let me know. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, I have some people uh, in the audience that uh, created this project, but uh, the, the Grin project that I mentioned before, it uses uh, uh, Souffle, and it also uses Souffle and Haskell in an experimental uh, uh, pull request uh, already. Um, yeah, there's still a big refactor going on there, uh, but once it's finished, then it will be easier to use things like Souffle. Uh, because yeah, the, the abstract syn syntax tree will be uh, modified to, to uh, make more easily use of Souffle. Uh, but some early results uh, are looking really promising and it's all thanks to Souffle. My, my library <laughs> has nothing to do with it basically. It's just uh, like a, a bridge between the two languages, but uh, yeah, it shows a 40 times uh, speed up and that's all because of the efficient C++ code uh, that comes out. So that's really promising. Uh, and I'm definitely going to keep an eye on that. 
Uh, and then another project also from the Grin team uh, is uh, the, the, the Haskell compiler, the whole program compiler. So it takes in all the Haskell files of your program all at once uh, and it compiles it uh, all into one single uh, yeah, output file, I guess you can call it. Uh, and yeah, again, there's a lot of uh, uh, complicated algorithms. They're really heavy and Souffle is also used there uh, for the for some of those algorithms. Um, yeah, and, and the links that I uh, added here in the presentation go to the, the data log code, uh, if you want to look at, at it afterwards. And yeah, maybe, hopefully I uh, inspired some of you to start uh, tinkering with it yourself and start writing some uh, souffle code yourself. Um, if you have some cool ideas, please let me know. Or maybe we can work together on something. Uh, that would be really cool. Um, yeah, myself, I'm still discovering new things. Uh, yeah, every every week or so, there's yeah, there's a lot of things undiscovered yet. So uh, yeah, it's also really fun. Uh, yeah, and as uh, the conclusion, so yeah, I hope I convinced all of you that there's a kind of really powerful synergy going on between functional programming and logic programming. So functional programming is mostly about uh, data types and uh, functions that transform the data from one form to another. And uh, logic programming or, or souffle in this case, it's about taking data and generating even more data. So yeah, it, 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 kind, of, it kind of makes your uh, functional programs even more powerful. So it's like the, the fuel to the engine. Uh, and yeah, I, I still think that this uh, combination of technologies is uh, underexplored, uh, or just data log in general is, uh, or the use cases for it is underexplored. So I would uh, yeah urge everybody to to start playing with it, uh, find cool use cases. Uh, if you really start looking, you you start to find uh, graphs in in all kinds of places, and that's all. Uh, uh, yeah, those are all good places to start using Souffle. Um, yeah, and another thing I want to mention is that, yeah, the Haskell type system is really amazing. Didn't talk too much about it today, but uh, when developing Souffle Haskell, uh, especially when working with the lower level stuff, uh, like integrating with uh, C++, um, yeah, that's normally really tricky in other languages, but in Haskell, it was actually really pleasant uh, because, yeah, your pointers, for example, on the type level, it is stored which kind of pointer it is. So, yeah, it's, it's just really nice to work with. And also the compile time errors uh, that, that, they can be, that they can be made uh, fully custom, that you can write uh, really uh, uh, strict functions and what they accept. Yeah, that, that's something that's not possible yet in most other languages. And that, that's just so much fun uh, to work with and it's really empowering. Uh, but one, yeah, one final thing I do have to mention that's less, uh, that, that was less fun is that the combination of Haskell and C++ uh, together with Cabal, the, the Haskell package manager, it, it can be quite tricky um, because yeah, you, you have to configure Haskell, you have to configure C++ and it all has to work together nicely. Um, yeah, that can be quite complicated. Um, but yeah, a good thing is that uh, Souffle Haskell does most, most of that for you. Um, so you can yeah start using it and uh, <laughs> Leave the difficult part uh, up to me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if there are any more questions, uh, now's the time to ask them. If you uh, are interested in more stuff like this, you can always uh, follow me on Twitter. I, I tweet about uh, functional programming, uh, compilers, uh, logic uh, in general. Um, uh, yeah, also, if I have Souffle Haskell updates, I post it there. And if you want to see what the code actually looks like uh, on GitHub, uh, you can find the yeah, it's this URL right here. Um, and there's also a final URL and that is this presentation itself. Uh, and yeah, that's here in the, in, the, in the bar at the top. So if you leave off this part, then you go back to the beginning of the presentation. So that's it. Uh, I, I, I hope uh, everybody found it interesting. And uh, yeah, if there are any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you very much, Luke, for the terrific talk. Uh, we do have a few questions. One question for me quickly first. It's actually more your opinion. Um, I realize I've never asked anybody or thought about it too deeply. Um, in comparing functional programming and logic programming, 
do you feel that logic programming is simply a, a subset or extension to functional programming or are there different domains that happen to have some tight relationship? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I myself, I, I view them as kind of different things. Um, well, you, you, you can write, uh, the, the, you can build the data log approach in something like Haskell. Eh? So you have things like logic T, um, but yeah, does that mean that it's a subset of another? I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I just view them as different approaches uh, and one approach is better for certain use case and the other is uh, good in other use cases. Uh, and yeah, the nice thing about combining languages is that you can use the strong parts of each language uh, and, and, and yeah, hopefully have an easier time implementing uh, your solution. Okay, just curious to hear what you thought. I, I kind of relate them in my mind, but I don't know if this is um, a proper relationship. So I, I got a question from uh, Jean privately. So Jean, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Please go ahead and ask. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, we, uh, I'm a part of a project in which we are using Twitter and we are uh, trying to understand links between tweets and retweets and things like that. And one of the one of the guy in the team suggested to use GNN, graph neural networks. Does that okay. fit into your uh, approach? Could that be uh, that that we could use Haskell, GNN? and souffle to uh, analyze those uh, because in, in it's a kind of a, uh, a graph these these tweets and retweets and the people who tweet and so on what, yeah. what is your advice um well <laughs> uh, I, I think they are slightly different yeah i have to admit that i'm not that familiar with uh, neural networks yet um but i think yeah underneath the hood it does a lot of uh, yeah, weighted calculations and, and based on input uh, data from the past, it tries to find new links in the future. But yeah, maybe graph neural networks are like a special variant of that. Um, it's actually something interesting that I, I need to look into. Uh, but the way you would do it in Souffle, I think, is uh, you, you use the Twitter API, you get all the tweets and uh, retweets and stuff like that. Uh, those are actually a kind of fact that you can submit to Souffle. And then in your Souffle code or in the Haskell code, if you use the DSL, you can start uh, creating relations between all those things. So you can start and then you can start querying like uh, what are, um, yeah, I, I don't know the specific things you are looking for, but uh, yeah, you can write it down in like a kind of query uh, like we did with Reachable at the beginning. Um, and then it can give you back all those results um, and you can compute uh, aggregates over it, like the maximum, the minimum, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. for that, you would have to use the souffle code directly, but that's all possible. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I see. Uh, I think I, I understand a little bit where we can go with this. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And yeah, maybe... Uh, Maybe you can use a mix of the technologies. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know enough about your application, but maybe some parts are easier done with Souffle and maybe yeah. some other parts are easier done with a uh, neural network. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't have to be black and white uh, all the time. <laughs> yeah, right. Thanks. Yeah. So we have another question from Tom. Okay. Uh, hi, Luke. Uh, do you support provenance information? with your library? Um, I, yeah, I, I don't think so yet. Well, I, I don't have, um, I don't have functions exposed for it, but um, yeah, is it something that you write down only in the in the souffle code or how, how does it work? I'm, I'm not that familiar with it yet. So uh, that's maybe something I, I still need to build. Uh, okay, I was curious because I was curious if maybe we could talk about your approach and your design to it, but uh, maybe we'll connect yeah. offline. Sorry, I, yeah, I haven't built it yet, but uh, yeah, send me a message on, on Twitter or uh, yeah, in the chat here afterwards, I can, uh, yeah, we, we could talk about it. <laughs> 
So no other questions at the moment, but um, oh, wait, sorry, I spoke too soon. Gabriella has a question. So Gabriella, you can unmute to ask if you like. Uh, hi, so thanks for the talk. Uh, I might have missed something, but in the first approach where you have a data log file and you're using the Haskell API, uh, you have to declare some boilerplate uh, data types uh, to describe the data log file structure. Uh, how is that, uh, how do you keep that in sync? Uh, I mean, if the boilerplate declarations in your Haskell file match the data log file, is that checked at compile time, at um, runtime, both? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, let me think about that. <laughs> I think it's easier if I have the slide open. So yeah, what you're asking is you have these types here, uh, the facts or predicates, and then you have the types uh, here and how to keep them in sync. Uh, yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, uh, yeah, it's not uh, really checked right now. So yeah, um, that's something you need to take into account. Also the direction. So. It, if you say that something is an input, but it's an output, uh, then also strange things happen. Uh, but what I would suggest here is that if you make uh, a modification to the uh, data log code, uh, then you you double check that your Haskell code is still in sync and that you have yeah, and that you definitely uh, you should always have unit tests. Uh, but that yeah, that did part that this part is uh, properly tested um, so that you know for sure that no uh, strange things occur. Um, yeah, I guess that's also an added benefit if you do it uh, in Haskell because uh, if you use the EDSL because then they're always in sync and with this approach, uh, that's not the case. Um, yeah, that's something to watch out for. That's a good point. Yeah. Thanks. So yeah, my, my, my suggestion there would be <laughs> test it really well and make sure that if you make a change in one of the two, that it's the same on the other side. Yeah. So one more question for me, slightly biographical. You said before um, you used to be a C++ programmer. I'm curious to hear how you ended up uh, in the Haskell world. Everyone always has a kind of interesting story there. Okay. Um, well, yeah, my first job was uh, C++ just because uh, there's a lot of C++ jobs here in the neighborhood. Um, but I, I, yeah, I actually came into contact with uh, functional program already at the university. Uh, and, and it was a Erlang course and a Haskell course. Um, and it just, it, it was in the back of my mind. So the, yeah, the Haskell code back then was uh, really, really simple. So uh, like uh, lists and recursion and yeah, that, that was probably the most complicated uh, um, code that we came across uh, because yeah, Haskell is a, a complex language you only have so little time. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, uh, I, I kept using Elixir mostly uh, after I, I graduated and uh, wrote quite a lot of programs in that. Uh, also my master thesis was also in Erlang because I, yeah, I had already gotten a bit by the functional programming bug by then. Uh, but yeah, once I started working, uh, yeah, I started uh, doing or using Elixir more. Um, and yeah, at, at some point, um, yeah, Elixir is, yeah, it, it offers a lot, but on, on the theoretical side, uh, it's much less. And that's, yeah, that's both a pro and con compared to Haskell. And I was wondering what else is there. And then I, yeah, I started looking into Haskell and then I came across uh, what I wish I uh, knew when I was uh, learning Haskell from uh, Stephen Deal. And that's how I learned uh, Haskell. And, yeah, to me, Haskell feels uh, very similar to C++ in some kind of strange ways. Maybe it's not that low level, unless you use the C++ uh, or, or the low level uh, FFI, uh, then, then it starts feeling really a lot like C++, but also, uh, yeah, some other things also feel uh, related to it. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I can put my finger on it, what, what it is exactly. Um, 
but yeah, I, I was hooked immediately. And also just the fact that it's so easy to write uh, code that is much more uh, robust than in other languages. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> like I said at the beginning of the talk, that's what I care about a lot. And if, ha yeah, Haskell focuses on that a lot. So it's a really good match. And that's why, I, uh, that's how I ended up in Haskell. And, and that's, I think, five years ago or so now. And yeah, there's there's just so much to learn in Haskell compared to other languages. I'm still learning uh, new stuff every day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is my feeling about Haskell. I mean, in programming, it always feels like there's no limit to what you can learn. Um, Haskell's flexibility and power means that, I mean, ultimately, you can model anything in it, right? Yeah. Yeah, and there's also the, the math uh, side of things, which is also something that you don't come across that much in other languages. Uh, I'm still struggling sometimes with that. Uh, yeah, some some of the more basic category theory stuff, that's uh, quite doable for me now. But like, uh, if it starts talking about uh, pro functors and everything beyond that, then uh, yeah, I, I really need to sit down and go really slowly through it and yeah. Yeah, I think this is a complaint some people have about Haskell, but um, which I don't know, maybe it's legitimate. I, I think it's one step at a time with all, all of these yeah. things. And what I find interesting about Haskell and maybe FP not Haskell is its universality. So of course, if you have something so closely connected to mathematics, there are some complicated things that you can do and a lot of things are difficult to understand. You yeah. don't need to you don't need to understand all of them and you can leverage a lot of Haskell and get a lot of power from it without understanding those things. Yeah, exactly. If you just know uh, about semi-groups, monoids, uh, and functors, applicatives, and monads, just those five, yeah, maybe not everybody knows about those five already, but if you know those five, you can do actually quite a lot already. Um, and you can leverage powerful libraries that other people have written like this. Yeah, and another thing is that uh, because so much is based on math, yeah, math is much older than programming, so yeah, there's just so much more that's already been discovered that you can use. Uh, and I feel like in other languages, uh, they, they take so much longer to reinvent stuff. And in Haskell, they just take a look at some paper or uh, take, a, take a look at some mathematical uh, theorem. And yeah, they can just pour it over really easily. And that's, yeah, that's also something really nice about Haskell. But uh, yeah, like you said, uh, there's a lot of concepts and you can't learn them all, all, uh, all at once. And, yeah, uh, that's a pro and a con. If you like learning, <laughs> then uh, you can stay busy for a really long time. Uh, but that's also a con if you have, for example, a team working at, on a Haskell code base and you want to onboard uh, somebody. So it, it's like a, a double-edged kind of sword. Uh, it, it can be frustrating if you want to be, quote unquote, practical um, and accomplish things very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, the learning curve is definitely steeper than in, in, than in other languages. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your work with us this evening. I hope you uh, had a good time. Uh, it's strange having these talks virtually. I know it's a little bit impersonal, but I think we had some nice questions and it was uh, very interesting to see what you've been doing and to hear your story. Yeah, <laughs> the funny thing is I've given this talk, uh, I think, six times now, and uh, each time I get new IDs. So this time it's uh, the graph neural networks and provenance and also that other technology that I forgot the name of. And it's something new like that every time. So, yeah, I, I, I have uh, like a whole new batch of IDs that I need to work on and uh, figure out what it's all about. And yeah, that's, that's really cool. So uh, thank you all for the questions and giving me uh, new IDs. I think that was the Picot language that uh, you were referring to. Yeah, I uh, haven't heard of it yet, but uh, yeah, that's uh, something I need to look into. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's very difficult to have anything resembling a community uh, in the current circumstances, but we're doing our best. So thank you, Luke, once again. Thanks everyone in the audience for joining us and for your questions. And we have another talk next week and the following week and on into February and uh, we'll continue until I run out of energy for doing this. <laughs> so take care, everyone. Take care, Luke. Bye bye. Yeah. Keep it up. You're doing a great job. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. Ciao, everyone. Bye, everyone.